During the first decade of the HIV epidemic in Uganda, everyone was either infected or affected by the disease. It claimed lives and many lost their parents, children, friends and neighbors. However, HIV prevalence declined from 21% to 9.8% between 1991 and 1998. The country was hailed internationally for its efforts in reducing the spread of HIV AIDS compared to other African states. This was especially through effective campaigns like promotion of abstinence and condom use while discouraging multiple sexual partners. Sadly, many young people today may be complacent about HIV as they have not lived through the years before medications were available. A time when AIDS was killing thousands of people each week. In 2018, the Academy for Health Innovation collaborated with Uganda AIDS Commission, TASO, the National Museum of Uganda, and other implementing partners to develop an exhibition detailing the journey of HIV response in Uganda. This was in an effort to document Uganda's history with HIV and to celebrate the progress the country has made in fighting the pandemic. The exhibition was made possible with research from historical archives, accounts of people living with HIV and other stakeholders like researchers, academicians, politicians and HIV activists. Through showcasing materials collected over the last 30 years of the HIV response in Uganda, this exhibition sought to bring together research and lived experiences to show the many textures of HIV advocacy and outreach since the disease first hit Uganda. This was later turned into a traveling exhibition and is now available online to remind the younger generation When it landed, AIDS exploded like a nuclear bomb in Uganda. The first recorded case of HIV in the country was in 1982. Before it had a name, many feared the new mysterious disease and blamed it on witchcraft. As the dead bodies piled up, Uganda was in a state of shock and then denial. Raka district is a district which is believed to be known for where HIV started from. But that AIDS started without knowing it. You see people selling they die. Echila langa bongera ko, nti bai no kuziza ba na ba tan naruala. O kwatiwa o mtego guli. Kati ngaba kuzesa ejirita. Ngaba sala ono mruwa debo ba soko kugema aone. Kati ngaba sasa zisedirita yemu. Kuba member bonda ba family. Oru siba itanga ne boruganda bonda. Haga mumu tego guze mchika. Mwena mujie msa unajia. Basa ugunga ba, ba goba kufuna sendi. Aba ntubati ya nyo. Wanga kabu na mspidi ya hili. Aba ntubati nyo nyo nyo. Aba ntubati nyo kusengu kamitumu. Buya wanga muganda. Chitao, mchala u. Gatu ya gana na mutu unako. Tso kila da ntubati wana ntubati langa u. Na iwa genda wangu kufanga tucha ya gala. Kula nganaba ntubo na. Tiba gana na kula. Kwa when a lady was brought from Congo and he dumped in our OPD department, I was a student in a pediatric ward. So all people ran. Health workers took off because a strange disease has been dumped at the OPD in our original fire hospital. Across the country, people had different names for HIV AIDS. But wherever you went, it was a disease which was whispered about and brought terror in the hearts of all those who heard about it. It took great courage for Ugandans to come face to face with the reality of how quickly HIV AIDS was sweeping through the country. 
Out of fear, many turned to churches, mosques, and traditional leaders in the hope of finding a cure for the disease. In 1987, the aid support organization TASO was formed and was the first of its kind to offer support to people and families affected by HIV AIDS. TASO also created awareness about the risks of contracting HIV, even if many were still in denial about how the virus was spread. Despite the toll, AIDS had been a taboo subject in Uganda, a shameful secret. And then on April 13th, 1989, Philly Lutaya became the first prominent African to publicly declare he had AIDS. AIDS is here, but people wanted always to ignore it and uh, pretend as if it was not here. So I wanted to go on shouting loud about this crisis. I, did, I ignored people who are who were calling me a liar, people who were calling me an opportunist, I knew time would come when they would understand. The last time Philly had been home, he was in the early stages of AIDS and appeared healthy. I see people coming nearer to look at me to, as if they don't believe it's me, yet now they believe they know that I'm, uh, I'm in big trouble. But there's nothing they can do, or nothing they can do about it. In this city, where up to 35% of Philly's age group are HIV positive, alone had a powerful effect. They were talking almost about, and then the first survey which we did was um, we had about 872,000 cases in the whole country. Uh, that was the prevalence of the disease. Since 1982, the disease was, was doubling every six months. By 1998, the rate of new HIV infections in Uganda had significantly decreased. This was possible because HIV AIDS had become central to the country's public dialogue. In 1986, the National Resistance Movement government came into power. They quickly realized that AIDS was about to explode into a major public health problem. Rather than deny it as the previous government had, they decided to tackle the problem head on. The re-removing of, of, of things, I think, came in 1996 when a research had been done and actually it was found out that about 30% of the, of, of, of the people in Uganda, you know, had, had HIV. And uh, so a bigger effort, mobilization, sensitization, which was actually started by the president himself. There was fear, there was, there was concern, and the government was, was involved. As part of this sensitization, the government undertook an aggressive media campaign. Using posters, billboards, television, radio, and newspapers, the country was presented with information aimed at presenting facts about HIV and AIDS. We knew that there was a school in every district. There was a church in every district or the mosque in every, every district and every village. So we took advantage of that. We set up school health program, which went down up the grassroots. We set up a religious program, but with them. Philly Lutaya had sparked a movement which made heroes of ordinary people. Despite the stigma they faced, many came forward to address the HIV AIDS epidemic. 
In 1992, Reverend Canon Gideon Biamugesha, an Anglican priest, became the first religious leader in Uganda to publicly announce that he was HIV positive. Two years later, Moses Supercharger Nsuboga, a local musician and radio host in Uganda, also spoke out about his positive status. Um, personally, I had a, a beautiful wife. As you know my story, in 1992, my wife I'd heard about HIV. I had not heard about this HIV. But the way she knew it, it was witchcraft way. She told me that Moses, you're sleeping around. But I've heard that when you sleep with somebody's wife, that person can send you a witchcraft, which can make you thin, which can make you feel sick every day. But, but I'm worried that I've heard that when you, the husband, gets it, you can pass it to me your wife, the mother of your children. Caring for patients in the beginning was very difficult. People were paranoid and feared that HIV AIDS could be transmitted through touching or being in the same room with an infected person. This discrimination also extended to the medical profession where doctors were reluctant to deal with patients who were admitted with symptoms of HIV AIDS. Because of the stigma associated with the, the disease, there were people who were reluctant to have an AIDS clinic in the medical patient. Somebody arrived in a casualty with the severe signs of AIDS severe waste loss, diarrhea, loss rash. And somebody, a senior person, told that the relatives who brought the person to hospital, that they better take her home alive because it's cheaper than taking a dead body because there was nothing that could be done. I felt bad about this. In 1991, my friend was affected by HIV, by SLIM. So we started looking after him. But when he was going to die, he, he was very sick. He was put separate in a room. And nobody would enter there except the parents and I as his friend. Realizing the psychological impact this kind of stigma had on people living with HIV, their families and caretakers, Tasso created a philosophy which revolved around living positively with HIV AIDS and dying with dignity. It is Tasso that brought all these ideas of, of how to handle a person with HIV. But then indeed it became a philosophy because everybody would say he, he needs Tasso. Uh, meaning that, you know, all this problem, you need us. When the people came to this ISS clinic, we were the first counsellors. We'd first give this person a hug. So the doctor now had clear evidence that if this non-medical person really strongly believes that this person can be hugged, how about me with the science that I have? For us, we started with the individual. How do we help this individual cope? And we went to the family, then we went to the community, and then, you know, so that they, they, wherever they are, they are assisted. We started things like the daycare center. When you come, as you wait for the doctor, we used to do the sensitization. Rather than you sit there idle and focus on your disease. Organizations and community leaders also set up clinics, outreach programs, and drama groups as strategies to demystify the disease. Counselors from these organizations also provided support to families, caretakers, and children orphaned by HIV AIDS who were unable to support themselves. At that time, it was just talking to these people, encouraging them and giving them hope that they can live. Most people positive at that time, they were having a challenge of food and nutrition. So RFC, I think with support from World Food Program, they had the food that was being brought to these patients. Then they would give beans, then they would give rice and cooking oil and powdered milk.
The first HIV test came to Uganda in 1986. Ten years later, it was possible to walk into any hospital and get a test for as little as 1,000 Uganda shillings. However, it would take as long as two weeks to get results back. That time, not very many people were coming for the HIV test and it was only the bold that would come for the HIV test or those who are very ill under the guidance of their family members, they would take a test. And for me, I took a test and it, it took uh, the, the health facility two weeks to give me my result. But I know my husband was tested. By then I was in school and when he was tested, they kept it a secret and they didn't tell because, you know, the fears around what will happen if the person is positive, what will other family members think. You know, the stigma was very high and being told you are HIV positive was like a death sentence. In the year 2000, I was now a mother of two. And when I tested HIV positive, it was at um, AIDS Information Center in Imbarara. How I came to test for HIV, it's because my girl, my baby girl had eczema and it was severe eczema. Today, you can walk into any hospital or clinic in Uganda and get free counseling, an HIV test, and the results back in 30 minutes. There are also home testing kits available in the country Sadly, because of ARVs, some people seem to take HIV for granted. Before ARVs were available, some religious leaders and traditional herbalists thought they could cure the disease. On November 11th in 1989, the New Vision published an article about an elderly woman, Nanyonga, from Masaka District, who claimed that the soil from her garden could cure AIDS. Thousands rushed to her home, believing rumors that the soil mixed with some water had cured her niece, Margaret Naziwa, from the virus. Medical doctors at the time were frustrated by their efforts to push for healthy lifestyles and provide adequate treatment. Twafulanga omulwadde najja naye ngo bagenda ku diagnosing bamusanga alina complaints 14 asesema adokana akolola yeta kula nviri zisenyuse aina alsazi aina musujja by that time, around 92-93 there, to turn the treatment by syndromic management. By the time ARVs were available in Uganda, some doctors were still afraid of coming in contact with HIV patients. While advances were still made in treatments, there was still a sense of stigma, something which Philly Lutaya had personally experienced. Philly's feet and legs were still bothering him, but two Ugandan doctors had refused to treat him because they were afraid to touch an AIDS patient. Finally, a compassionate physiotherapist volunteered to help. Philly's experience with the doctors was not uncommon, and the problem was on his mind when he appeared before medical students at Makeri University, Uganda's only medical school. I have been told that some doctors in Uganda need to be educated and sensitized towards AIDS patients. <laughs> Ralelo, <laughs> 
Echo kubiriti. Durie ndagala. Dia lingalia kutamboli long distances. Na yo ralelo. Tuina nature. Tuita CDDP. Nga plant. Basu vro kuleti li dagala uole. No lifuni lao. No suvolo kubango tambla blonji. And when they were first available, ARVs were hard to find. They were also too expensive and had terrible side effects like bleeding, diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart complications. This is why many chose to hide their HIV positive status from their partners and families. Still, my husband was sick and he was not really disclosing to me. But because I had the feel about HIV and AIDS, I could look at him and then you know, testing with eyes. And uh, he was an army officer working with the state house. So he used to move a lot. This week he's not in the, he's not there. He's, he's gone somewhere else. He has been deployed maybe to move, you know, wherever the president is moving, uh, he goes with that team. But at the same time, if when he, whenever he would come back, I would look at him, start observing him. I'm like, but are we safe? Yet he had tested and had hid his results. By the time I landed on his results, he was very, very sick. Given the reluctance around voluntary testing, programs were later created to encourage people to check their HIV status and if found positive, seek treatment to avoid opportunistic infections. Whoever went for treatment for, for HIV, whoever test, tested reactive would eventually get that information and in fact be told that you are not only going to take ARVs, but you are going also to take cotrimaxazole, which, which was known to fight opportunistic infections. Before modern medicine, people living with HIV AIDS relied on nutrition and local herbs as a way to prolong life and cope with symptoms or opportunistic infections. Many were shunned by the community from the physical symptoms they suffered from the disease. We had an uncle, a prominent businessman. Um, he had a number of women somewhere in a row, somewhere in Kampala. So when he contracted the disease, uh, by then people would live in denial. They would not want to believe uh, that they are carrying the virus. Um, he would refuse medical attention. <coughs> started deteriorating. You know he was so fat. Then later on he started on, he would even add like two, three sides on his body for people to believe he's still okay. Even trousers will be added. So that was until he died. HIV AIDS stigma and discrimination did not only affect those living with the disease, but also extended to their family members and caretakers. This encouraged secrecy in families, even during funerals. Many partners and children who were left behind by HIV positive family members were often in the dark about their own status. I was uh, now still uh, a youth, continued with my studies. When I, I reached uh, a level of uh, getting into a relationship with my late husband. I, I didn't know that we really had to take an HIV test first, yet we were in the condom campaign during that time of 1990 to 1992 by Uganda Red Cross and the campaign was done by the youth. But at that time speaking about a condom still was a challenge. I remember they would look at us as Spoiled girls. Your brother died. He died of HIV. But the wife has to be inherited. And now, without knowing whether the wife is still carrying the infection or not, now we can say this conduct couple. But this was not known. I deliver the baby boy. I knew that boy was positive. Straight away. And I could not even take him for a test. I refused. I said, mm -mm. 
let him stay like that. Not until he finished S4, they took him here, he was tested and found negative. In the late 90s, over one million orphans had lost their parents to HIV AIDS. Many moved between relatives who sometimes considered them a burden, especially if they too had been infected with the virus. To promote change in care and adherence to ARVs, government and private organizations changed their communication about the possibility of living a healthy life despite being HIV AIDS positive. It was counseling before to live positively, you know, wait to die. And now it is, you know, uh, start your treatment, adhere to your treatment. Tasso came in, the counseling improved very well. We, people living with AIDS, were also able to be incorporated in the counseling training. So we were able to give not only real counseling, but also peer to peer counseling. So that's how slowly we came out of that feeling of uh, too much discrimination and stigma. Uh, in fact, I think I am confident to say that the kind of counseling we got those days was much better than what a newly diagnosed patient would get right now. there have been campaigns to educate people about the risks of contracting HIV AIDS. These include abstinence from sex, condom use, and fidelity in relationships. One of the most powerful advocacy tools is accounts of people who have either been infected or affected by HIV AIDS. I wish I was just on an ordinary visit here. I used to come and visit my sister here some years ago. But today I have come to stand before you as a living example of an AIDS victim. This is serious. I never wanted this to happen to me. So straightforward, I would like to tell you that I would not like this to happen to you, to any of you. The message I would like to give to you is that let us do our best to have a virus-free young generation. In times of joy, in times of sorrow. Anywhere you talk about Phoebe, they no longer look down upon him as you know, an outcast. Or everybody is in love with him. After people have seen him, there is a, a general feeling of quiet, a general feeling of uh, someone needs to, to reflect. It's as if they are, they are actually seeing AIDS with a face. There was a time when an HIV-positive diagnosis meant the end of someone's life. Some people even committed suicide to avoid the humiliation and pain that came before death. Prevention campaigns were rolled out nationwide to remind people about the physical and psychological risks of contracting HIV AIDS. Politicians were instructed to mention AIDS at any, at every occasion, whether wedding, uh, funeral, or what. We were instructed, go out. Whenever you have a call, must say something about AIDS. That was around about... Uh, 88, 88, 89. There was a policy that every Monday, in every school in Uganda, the head teacher at assembly must communicate a message on AIDS. And that started especially after Philip Retire's initiative. And that was in the 1990s, early 1990s. Every year on December 1st, Uganda joins the rest of the world to commemorate World AIDS Day. Since 1988, this has been globally recognized as the day to increase awareness of HIV AIDS campaigns, 
efforts and advances in treatment and care. Over the years, there has been a significant improvement in counseling, testing and treatment. A lot has changed from 2006 up to now, I can say. Uh, I can actually come out boldly and be like, hey everybody, I'm HIV positive. And uh, trust me, no one would believe that because I look more healthy than those people of those days. I don't know when I last, I last tested like I'm non-suppressed. I've now lived over, over eight years with non-suppressed viral load up to now, and I'm still living. Looking back on a history where at least every family lost someone to AIDS is no easy task. But keeping their memories alive is another way of honoring the courage with which they faced the HIV AIDS pandemic. In Uganda, 50% of the AIDS victims are women. Women in Uganda, in Africa, must join the battle against AIDS. When we talk about the battle against AIDS, we must forget blame. Blame is not productive. I know that I contracted the virus from a woman, but I don't blame that woman. That woman was definitely given the virus by a man. The first time I knew HIV could be even in my home and in my bedroom was when I saw my husband sick. And of course, when the new disease comes like that, uh, they will tell you what are the signs, the symptoms. And I kept watching my husband with all these signs and symptoms. And the most visible sign and uh, the sign of HIV was the, the, the way it gives you the wasting syndrome. You will become smaller and smaller and weaker and weaker and the, the rashes on the skin were evident. So I knew there was a problem in my home. Changes must be made in our sexual behavior. For the past years, we have been so free in our sexual behavior. Adultery is a serious threat to all of us, and it must stop. Adultery by either sex presents a danger to the other partner and ultimately to the whole family. If we don't work hard, the human race is going to die. You can do your part in the fight against HIV AIDS by using condoms, getting regular tests, and if found positive, being honest about your status with your partner. For more interesting stories and artifacts, go to www.historyofhiv.ug. To participate in project research, free HIV counseling and testing, contact 0751-051-866 or 0779-452-176.